Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are starting a section on pulmonary physiology. This is recording part one. Let's start by reviewing the anatomy of the tracheal bronchial tree. It begins in the upper airway, the nose, the mouth, and the pharynx, where air enters and is humidified and filtered. The air then passes through the trachea, which is the conduit for ventilation, and a place where clearance of tracheal and bronchial secretions can occur. The trachea begins at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage and extends all the way down to the carina, an average length of 10 to 13 centimeters. The trachea is composed of these C-shaped cartilaginous rings which form the anterior and the lateral walls, and you can see these cartilaginous rings when you do bronchoscopy. The carina bifurcates into the right and left main stem bronchi. The right main stem bronchus is more vertical relative to the trachea, and the left is more horizontal. That's why foreign bodies tend to lodge in the right main stem, and main stem intubations are usually on the right side. The tracheal bronchial tree continues to undergo dichotomous division, starting at the carina and continuing for about 23 generations. The tracheal bronchial tree is lined with mucosal epithelium. The cells start as ciliated columnar cells, then become cuboidal, and finally, flat alveolar epithelium. This is significant because gas exchange can only occur across flat epithelial cells, which begin at the respiratory bronchioles somewhere around generations 17 through 19. Prior to this level, we have what we would call the conducting zone, and this all adds to dead space, as we'll discuss in a few moments. The respiratory bronchioles are also lined with smooth muscle, which can dilate in response to sympathetic stimulation and constrict in response to parasympathetic stimulation. The columnar and cuboidal epithelium have cilia, which normally beat in a synchronized fashion in order to move mucus and other bacteria and debris upwards towards the mouth. As we move down these generations, the airway walls gradually lose their cartilaginous support and their smooth muscle, so that the only thing keeping them open is the radial traction by the elastic recoil of the surrounding tissue. And as we'll see later, this can lead to collapse of the smaller airways. The alveoli are at the end of the tracheal bronchial tree. Each sac contains about 17 alveoli for a total of about 300 million alveoli in the lungs. Opened up flat, they would make a surface area of 50 to 100 square meters for gas exchange. When a patient is upright, the largest alveoli are at the pulmonary apex at the top, and the smallest tend to be at the base. We can think of the lungs as being suspended from the top of the thoracic cavity and hanging down, kind of like a slinky, so that the alveoli at the top are the most opened, and they're being pulled open, whereas the alveoli at the bottom tend to be a little bit smaller. Each alveolus has a capillary network, which begins with the pulmonary arteriole that brings blood to the alveoli, branching into this network of capillaries, and then after oxygenation, the blood is returned to the heart through the, alveo the pulmonary venules. Inspiration of air occurs when the diaphragm contracts. Here we see the diaphragm relaxed, and when it contracts, it pulls downward. This lengthens the, and the, the sort of the um, vertical diameter, the vertical dimension of the chest cavity. As you can see, the diaphragm is the primary muscle of inspiration, and it's innervated by the phrenic nerve, which is uh, C3 to C5. Accessory muscles of inspiration are the intercostal muscles. They are between each of the ribs, and when they contract, you can see they bring the ribs into a more horizontal position, which increases the AP diameter, the anterior-posterior diameter. All of these actions make the chest cavity larger in volume, and this creates a negative force, 
a negative pressure which draws air into the mouth and down into the lungs. Expiration is mostly passive. You just stop contracting your muscle as of muscles of inspiration and the passive elastic recoil of the lungs and the chest wall will push the air out. If people want to forcefully expire, like you do when you blow out or when you speak, the abdominal muscles are the primary muscles of expiration. You can think of the lungs like a balloon that floats inside this thoracic cavity and it's surrounded by a thin layer of pleural fluid. If we look at the edge of the lung right here, we can see that the lung has a pleural surface called the visceral pleura. The chest wall has a pleural surface called the parietal pleura. And in between is this little space called the pleural space, which is a virtual space that has a slight amount of pleural fluid. And this allows the lungs to slide fr with little friction inside the thoracic cavity. The pleural space actually has a slightly negative pressure, the intrapleural pressure, and this creates a suction that holds the lungs to the chest wall. Without this suction, the lungs would collapse because they're so elastic, like a balloon, that when they're empty, they would just collapse down into a tiny deflated balloon. Now, if a patient opens their mouth and opens their vocal cords, or their glottis, and they're not breathing in or out, then the pressure in all parts of the system is equal to atmospheric pressure. And we call this a pressure of zero centimeters of water because that's relative to atmospheric pressure. The whole system is in equilibrium. In order to breathe in, you only need to generate a negative pressure in the lungs of about minus one centimeters of water. And to breathe out, you only need a positive pressure of about plus one centimeters of water. And that's how expiration and inspiration normally occur. The transpulmonary pressure describes the pressure difference between what's in the alveoli and the intrapleural space. Again, the intrapleural space is this slightly negative space in the pleural space between the lung and the chest wall. And the alveolar pressure is the pressure inside the lung space in the alveoli. Transpulmonary pressure is the difference between these two, and it's usually positive. This describes the fact that the lungs are elastic. The inside of the lungs are coated with a substance called surfactant. Normally, a balloon filled with uh, water that lines the surface of the inside of the balloon will have surface tension. And this surface tension will make the uh, lungs even more elastic and make them collapse very easily. Conversely, the opposite of elasticity is compliance. When there's a lot of surface tension, the lungs won't be very compliant. And so you'll need to generate a lot of pressure and do a lot of work in order to send a certain amount of volume of gas into the lungs. What surfactant does is it decreases the surface tension. It reduces it. And so it makes the lungs less elastic and thereby more compliant. And so you can get more volume of air into the lungs for the same amount of pressure or the same amount of work. When we talk about pulmonary ventilation, we need to know about pulmonary volumes and capacities. There are four primary volumes which add up to the total amount of air the lungs are able to hold. We start by looking at tidal volume. Tidal volume is simply the volume of air that goes in and out with each normal resting breath. Expiratory reserve volume is the additional amount of air below tidal volume that you could expire with a forceful exhalation. So here's the end of a breath, and here's how much more you are able to blow out until you feel like your lungs are completely empty and you can't blow out anymore. Similarly, we have an inspiratory reserve volume, which is the amount of air that could be inspired as deep as you possibly can, greater than the amount you normally inspire during tidal volume breathing. These three together make your vital capacity, but there's actually more air in the lung, and we call this the residual volume. This is the volume of air that is still in the lungs even after you've breathed out until you feel like your lungs are totally empty. There's still about a liter of air in the lungs, and this is called the residual volume. These four volumes can be combined to create 
four lung capacities. The capacities consist of one or more different volumes added together. The one that we're going to focus on right now is the functional residual capacity, the FRC. This is the amount of volume in the lungs at the end of a normal breath, at the end of tidal volume breathing. It's your expiratory reserve volume and your residual volume added together. At the end of a normal breath, the mechanics of your lungs are at equilibrium. Your inward elastic recoil and your outward elastic recoil are equal to each other. FRC is important to us because it represents the amount of oxygen reserve we can create in an apneic patient. That is, when we pre-oxygenate a patient and fill up their lungs with oxygen for a few minutes, then we make them apneic and try to manage their airway, how much oxygen can we store in those lungs that gives us a reserve until they start to desaturate? So obviously, the bigger the FRC, the more time we have before patients start to desaturate during apnea. Factors that affect the FRC are important for us to know. FRC does not change with age, and it's most directly proportional to height. Taller patients have a larger FRC. Many factors decrease FRC, and we should be very familiar with them. Obesity, pregnancy, general anesthesia, restrictive lung disease, and the head-down position all decrease FRC. Moving a patient from an upright to a horizontal position, supine or prone, also decreases FRC. This may be in part due to collapse of the alveoli, which is atelectasis. We also need to take a moment and understand the concept of closing capacity. The closing capacity is the minimum volume, which is really the minimum pressure, required to keep your small airways from collapsing, which is atelectasis. Collapse occurs first in the dependent or the lowest areas of the lung, gravitationally. And the reason we care about this is because collapse or atelectasis has many undesirable and harmful effects, which we're going to describe later in our discussion of pulmonary physiology. But for now, what we need to know is that a patient can be breathing normal tidal volume breathing. They may take a deep breath in, they may blow all the way out, and at some point you can blow out far enough that you've crossed the closing capacity and you start to experience atelectasis in some of your alveoli. And then with your next breath, you pop them back open again. Like I said, we'll discuss why atelectasis is harmful later on. Now there are factors that affect where your closing capacity is. It's not affected by posture, so lying flat doesn't change it. It rises with age, so as our patients get older, closing capacity starts to rise. In obesity, we see that the FRC, normally FRC is far above closing capacity. But in obese patients, it can be far below closing capacity. So look at this patient who only experiences crossing the closing capacity. That is, this patient only experiences atelectasis if they blow out until their lungs are almost empty. But under normal breathing, they're not experiencing atelectasis. But as things change, let's say we have an obese patient or other factors that affect closing capacity. Now we have a patient whose FRC, that is their lung volume at the end of a normal breath, is so low that actually every breath goes below closing capacity. And so this patient is experiencing atelectasis every time they breathe out and the lungs are popping open again every time they breathe in. And we're gonna see that this is not good for the lungs. How can we fix it? Well, one thing we can do this is the same situation again with tidal volume breathing and the FRC going below closing capacity. If we add PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, we can increase where the tidal volumes are. The actual tidal volume itself is still the same size, but the FRC has been increased and it's above closing capacity again. Now every time the patient breathes, their lungs stay open and they don't cross the line here that signifies closing capacity.
Ventilation is a term which means movement of new air in and out of the alveoli. We can talk about minute ventilation. The easiest way to think of it is respiratory rate times tidal volume, which is very analogous to cardiac output that we described earlier. A normal minute ventilation is 3 to 10 liters per minute. But not all of the air that goes in and out of the lungs is helpful because some of it is in the dead space. Part of your lung volume consists of the parts of the respiratory system that can't participate in gas exchange because they don't have alveolar cells. This includes everything from your nose, your mouth, your pharynx, your trachea, and your large bronchioles. In addition, if you have any non-functioning alveoli that don't get very good blood flow, so they're also dead space because they can't participate in gas exchange if their blood flow is poor. And any plastic parts or rubber parts like the endotracheal tube or the LMA, any connectors all the way up to the Y piece, these are also part of dead space. When you ventilate patients with small tidal volumes, a large percentage of the tidal volume is only ventilating the dead space, which is at the top of the respiratory tree, and you may not have very much gas exchange occurring. So when we talk about minute ventilation and we look at the ventilator, this is the number we come up with, but we should appreciate that true alveolar ventilation has to account for that and say instead of the whole tidal volume, we should subtract away the dead space volume. Finally, I just want to highlight the cough reflex. This is a reflex in response to any sort of touch or irritation inside the tracheobronchial tree. The reflex starts with rapid inspiration of air and closure of the epiglottis and the vocal cords. Then the expiratory muscles contract reflexively and increase pressure in the lungs. Finally, the vocal cords open again so the air explodes outwards, hopefully carrying whatever the irritant is with it. That's the end of our first recording. Please do take some time to go over these new concepts, especially concepts like closing capacity and ventilation. If you have any questions, please let me know so I can help you understand them. And thanks for your attention.